They see who Jesus really is. And now this is a call for them to be who they really are. Today, we're going to talk about the transfiguration. And we get this wonderful passage from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's almost as if it picks up in the middle of the story. I love that. Yeah, I, sometimes I wonder about Stephen Langdon and when he uh, actually divided into chapters and verses uh, in the 13th century the scriptures and I wonder why he broke this piece off and put it in chapter 17 when it should have gone with chapter 16 but that's a whole other discussion that you're really not interested in so let's begin with what seven, chapter 17 in the gospel of Matthew verses 1 through 9 Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except for Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's Transfiguration Sunday. If I were to ask you this morning just to walk out in the crowd and take a microphone and say, please explain to me the transfiguration and its meaning for the church, most of us would probably say it has something to do with the shiny Jesus Uh, because that's kind of what we always focus on. Jesus was shining with a bright light. His clothes were like a bright light. And so almost instinctively we say, well, it's this shiny thing. And in fact, in the church, we are often affected by shiny objects, if you will. Uh, in fact, I'm one of those people, uh, Mike mentioned earlier, that uh, I, uh, Julie and I worked together. It was her first church out of seminary as my associate. She learned pretty early on that when we had a meeting, I needed to be with my back to the window because I was easily affected in a meeting by a shiny object and easily distracted away from things that ought to be, we ought to be working on. So most of us might simply say, Jesus is shiny. And we wouldn't be wrong because that is in the scripture. It is there. And it's, it's not really our fault that we talk about the shining Jesus because for the most part, preachers throughout the decades and the centuries have focused on that Christological statement of a shining, uh, shining raiment of Jesus and as he is uh, evidently now being shown as the deity, the divine and when he had only been before the disciples, for the most part, uh, in human form, doing miraculous things. So this week, we talk about transfiguration. About three years ago, in the church where I was serving, I was asked to go to a Sunday school class to teach Sunday school to the second graders uh, on Transfiguration Sunday. So they, they went around the room and read the Gospel of Matthew, and at the end of that, I said, do you have any questions? It was my fault, I asked the question. Um, So a little girl said, why did Jesus shine like sunlight? And then I used what I anticipated to be a too big word for a second grader to comprehend what was going on. I said, he was transformed. And a big smile came over the little boy sitting next to the little girl who had asked the question. He went, oh, Jesus is Optimus Prime, the transformer. (laughs) And, and I, I really wanted to tell him in a lot of ways he was right. He was the first best, which is exactly what that means. Uh, but then I, I kind of pushed it a little bit and I said, no, Optimus Prime is a character on the Transformers story. He's not really, he's not really who Jesus is. He, I, and, and the little boy said, I know, but he can be Optimus Prime, Jesus. 
and, and I thought, well, he might have a better understanding of this than I do. Because Jesus can transform not only the church, but all of us as individuals. Jesus can make that transfiguration happen for us. He had a great understanding of that. Now, this story of transfiguration is really a peek into an intimate moment with the big three, Peter, James, and John, who were always around Jesus, the ones closest to him for most of the time. And so when, when this moment comes, it's almost as if we're picking up the curtain a little bit and looking behind the curtain and seeing what's going on. For six days, the gospel said, uh, they had been brewing over something Jesus had said earlier. Jesus had been teaching. Uh, Jesus had, had been teaching the crowds about the kingdom of God. Jesus had been uh, walking on water. He had been changing water into wine. He, he, had, he had been healing the lame. He had been healing the deaf and the blind. He had been doing these miraculous things. And now they come to a moment where they get a peek into something totally different. But six days before this event, he had said, if you are going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself Take up your cross and follow. <laughs> you know, they were all in on the walking in water part. Uh, I suspect they were all in on the changing of water into wine. Uh, they were all in on the healing of the lame. But wait a minute, you mean I'm going to have to take up my cross and follow? So for six days they had kind of, uh, of dealt with that shocking statement, a challenge they had not heard before. So with that kind of a, a, of a nugget marinating in their minds, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain for an object lesson that will change the whole course of what they will be and what they will do in ministry from that moment on. Now the word transfiguration is very simple. It means to make something more beautiful and to elevate something to greater, greater elevation, to make it even greater than it appears before the transfiguring moment. What Peter, James, and John saw on the mountain that day was a revelation of who Jesus really was. Now, theologically, for generations, we've talked about this event as revealing the deity of Jesus. In the Western church, especially, we focused on the Christological conversation, whether or not we really mean what it means to be uh, Jesus as the divine Jesus of Nazareth. Not just human, but also divine. And so we, we got the human part, and this was a revelation of the divinity of Jesus. But in the Eastern church, it was a little bit different. The transfiguration not only meant that Jesus was truly divine, but this was a peak into something that would be after. It was in the Eastern Church an understanding that this is what Jesus is going to be like when he is resurrected from the dead. This is, what, this is who Jesus really is. And I love what Clement of Alexandria wrote about that as he read that piece. He said, even when Jesus had shown us his glory on the mountain through his disciples, he did not give the revelation for his own sake, but for the sake of the church to the end of the age. So this, this revelation of Jesus was not just a, a, a show. It was something so much different. So what does it mean for us at Bluff Park United Methodist Church in 2017 after hearing the children sing, the choir sing, after waiting to hear what the district superintendent, who's probably uh, a district superintendent because... Uh, he's not that good a preacher, would, would, uh, would come and, and, and share with us, what does it mean to us today? Well, that's a really good question. We have to go back to who was with Jesus at the moment. Yeah, Peter, James, John. But then there's that also the theophany of Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah also had a theophany. In Exodus 24, Moses goes up on the mountain and after many days, he receives, I love this, I, I, I read this by an author, I thought it was really great. It said, while on the mountain, Moses received eight chapters worth of instruction. Uh, that's what it is in the, in the book of Exodus. He received eight chapters of instruction. Then they have the golden calf incident down on the, on the foot of the mountain. He goes back up the mountain and comes back with a set of stone tablets. Guess what? When he came back from that mountain, he was shiny. He had been in the presence of God. His countenance had changed, the scripture said. Uh, I love that. One of my, <laughs> this is an odd movie, I know, to quote um, from a pulpit, but I'll do it anyway because um, I don't have to be here next Sunday. Um, uh, the History of the World Part Two 
uh, by Mel Brooks has an interesting scene that I've often thought was quite, quite, quite funny. M Mel Brooks comes, he's being Moses, he comes down from the mountain, he's carrying three stone tablets. And he said, God gave me these 15, he drops one and it breaks, these 10 commandments. <laughs> We get so tied up on the details of this, we miss what's really happening in the Scripture. And what's really happening in the Scripture is that Moses was being taught on the mountain so that he could teach the people. Think about Elijah. Elijah is also there. Elijah was fleeing Jezebel in, in Israel to Mount Oreb, and there at Mount Oreb, somewhere in the Sinai desert, desert uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, he encounters uh, he encounters God who gives him instructions about what he's going to do. Go back and anoint a new king, Aram, and a new king in Israel, and Elisha anoint him as your successor prophet. He was given instructions to enhance the life and the progress and the determination of God's will on his people. For Moses and Elijah to appear on that mountain that day is a signal that this is more than just a show of divinity. It is that, but it's more than just that. One of the great mysteries in Jesus' teaching is always that secretive command, don't tell anybody until it's the right time. Why would Jesus bring these three up and tell them, now wait a minute, don't tell them what you've seen. It may be because in that moment, they were not only experiencing the divinity of Christ and a shiny Jesus, but it may have been that they were given a moment of grace and wonder and approval just for them and the ministry that they would perform. Now that opens a completely different view of what was going on in this incredible scene. A call for Jesus' followers to be who they really are. You get it? They see who Jesus really is, and now this is a call for them to be who they really are. A few years ago, many of you may remember that uh, um, there was a Bruno's right down here on 150. Uh, 150 in Shadescrest Road, we're across there. It's now a YMCA. Uh, I've been there several times uh, trying to buy groceries and they won't let you at the YMCA. <laughs> but uh, when it was still a, a Bruno's, I walked in one afternoon, I'd been given instructions from my wife to go pick up a few things, and I was walking in, and as I did, I encountered a young, mo young mother with her, had a, she had a, a baby, probably uh, about, uh, maybe a year old, uh, and then she had about a five-year-old little boy, uh, and he, the five-year-old little boy uh, was wearing a Batman costume and cowboy boots, and it, it was so cute, and I, so as I kind of met them at the door, I said, I said, wow, there's Batman. Uh, and he puffed out his chest and followed his mom on into the store. It was, it was a great kind of thing. I thought, well, that's kind of neat. A few minutes later, I'm on one of the aisles, and, and I hear this clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity-clop of cowboy boots uh, running, obviously. And I looked up, and here comes the little fella. He jumps up on the front of my grocery cart, looks at me seriously, and says, I'm not Batman. I'm just wearing his clothes. In reality, too often in this world, we try to be somebody we're not. Too much has been, attention has been paid to trying to do things that we were not called to do. The Apostle Paul addressed that in Romans 12 when he simply wrote, quit trying to be something you're not and go ahead and be who you were called and created to be. And I think we need to follow that advice more than ever before. I think that is part of what this story of Jesus on the mountain is really all about. Jesus revealed himself to the three apostles that day so that they could live out the teaching that he was giving them about the kingdom of God. After all, we are created in the image of God. That means that God is already inside of us. It's who we really are. Oh yeah, we cover it up with a lot of stuff. We cover it up with anger. We cover it up with addiction. We cover it up with hatred. We cover it up with lots of things and it gets cloudy. But inside of us, we were all created in the image of God. It's a miracle to see Jesus on that mountain. 
He was calling Peter, James, and John to be who they really, really are. To really and truly understand many days later when he would stand before them just before he left them and left this world. He would give to them the Great Commission and they were to follow. Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But we have a tendency to be like Peter. Remember what Peter did? Let's, us, let's build a tabernacle here and we'll build one for you and for Moses and for Elijah. And a friend of, of, of mine and, and someone that uh, Angela and some others were sharing with this weekend, Ron Mortoya, uh, has reshaped that. He said, we are too much like Peter wanting to build the tabernacles and stay on the mountain. So he changed that Matthew 28 to say, this is what we sometimes do with it. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, therefore go and build sanctuaries with stained glass and contemporary gathering spaces with lights and media screens and do all you can to attract people to your meetings to sing songs, pray, collect money, and do some teaching. And I wish you luck till the end of the age and hope your market share increases. That's not the Great Commission. Ron reminded us just on Thursday that sometimes we get that wrong. We are called to go into the world to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus is leaving his earthly ministry behind, up on that mountain, he's passing the mantle to his disciples. And what better way to commission them to love the world than by demonstrating that being beloved means extending love to others. They were trembling on the ground. Jesus touches them and says, get up, do not be afraid. He transformed them from people who were afraid, who were so feared, filled with fear that they didn't even know what the next step was going to be. Have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever felt helpless and hopeless? He touched them and said, get up not be afraid. So maybe Jesus is a divine Optimus Prime, transforming all of us to be whom we were created to be, disciples, making disciples for the transformation of this world that's in so great need of transformation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit,